sometimes winning the biggest game is because you're playing the game right. You're not trying to win. You're just playing the best game. You're doing it for the game. That was like my first job was at like nine, 10 years old working at a barn. Hello, my fellow Martians. My name is Harry Mars, and this is the On Mars Pod, where we take a deep dive into creative professionals, entrepreneurs, and other inspiring Martians alike. Honestly, I've loved the simple lifestyle and the appreciation of less. It was almost like everything I was doing outside of photography was prepping me for photography. Yeah, man, I won't say anything about it. Like, it's the best camera in the world. And that's why I wanted to pursue it. And that's why I sold all my gear. Hello, my fellow Martians. Today on Mars, we are joined by director of marketing, business owner, and an award-winning film photographer. Everybody, please welcome Christian Markham. Thank you for being here today, brother. Yeah, thank you for having me. Of course. This is uh, Film is Dead, a.k.a. Film <laughs> is Dead, if you know him in the film community in Arizona. Um, but on Mars, we take a deep dive into creative professionals, entrepreneurs, and other inspiring Martians alike. That's why I had to have you on, man. Mm -hmm. You were on my list for a while now. So I'm so Thank stoked you. to be able to do this. Uh, so we got some mutual friends, um, a mm -hmm. bunch of mutual friends. That yeah, <laughs> But the, um, the way we met was uh, working with uh, a cannabis company out here mm -hmm. with David Ritter. Yes, sir. So that you were actually the one that hired me. We were talking about earlier. Yep, yep. <laughs> Funny how it worked, though. Like, uh, did the interview and then took me about three weeks to get in. By the mm -hmm. time I got in, <laughs> you were out of the company. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so it's just like, damn, didn't even get to work together. Nope. But uh, yeah, I'm glad we were able to keep in touch, bro. Yeah, no, uh, definitely. Um, it's been an, an interesting ride since then. And, yeah. um, you know, seeing David and yourself like kind of blossom into your own creations and going around doing your own stuff and whatnot. It's been cool to witness from afar and kind of come back around full circle and do what I've been doing with David too, between we're both still in the cannabis industry yep. um, and we get to work together quite often. And that's been really neat. And then full circle background doing this with you too so yeah it's been cool fuck yeah dude likewise i'm i'm stoked to get into this bro mm -hmm. so um the beginning of uh the episodes i kind of like to get a little bit of a backstory oh yeah so um i know you grew up in arizona in uh, mm -hmm. was it dewey yeah dewey. So that's a country country town yeah arizona's most country town is their <laughs> tagline yeah so uh what's the population of dewey first off oh damn dude i don't even know we're talking like say. under five thousand. yeah yeah, yeah, I would say so. I mean, yeah, um, to be, yeah, I don't really know, but like with my experience there, like it's very slim. small town. Yeah, yeah, um, especially anyone who's used to living like in the inner city, like Phoenix metro area, like you wouldn't, you wouldn't notice it really if you drove through it. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I guess that's like you a could good... go through the whole city and just be like, oh shoot, we passed it up. Yeah, like you can, like if you're going <laughs> north and you could drive right through it and be impressed and be like, oh, like. I didn't even know I drove through several towns. Wow. So it's so, it's in the Prescott area then around. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. It's like um like right after you get off the I-17, you start going into like rural era areas. Yeah. Um, Dewey is like right well, you hit Mare, then you hit Dewey, then you hit Prescott Valley, and then you hit Prescott. <laughs> oh, and shit. a lot of those towns, man, like Mare, Dewey, like even PV, Prescott Valley. It's funny because like really quick, I used to always refer to PV as Prescott Valley. And no, I come out here and now it's Paradise Valley. And, it, you know, total opposite sides of the <laughs> spectrum with towns and cities and whatnot. So I thought that's that was funny. funny. Dude, that's hilarious. <laughs> but yeah, dude, small, small town. But um, I was born in Phoenix. Okay. And uh, I mean, we bounced between Tucson and Glendale like I think until I was like seven or eight and then we and then we moved to Dewey oh wow okay mm -hmm. so you did grow up in the city then yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so um I have three younger brothers and um they all mostly like with their ages and whatnot remember mostly growing up in Dewey but I remember pretty clearly growing up in the city-ish area and then moving to Dewey and still having like 
even at that young of an age, like kind of a culture shock. Totally. With like, yeah. like we're living on dirt roads. Yeah, that's <laughs> different, dude. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. And I mean, being seven years old, you definitely have memories of yeah. like both sides. Oh, yeah. So uh, were you first born? Um, Phoenix? No, like, oh, our, no. like were you like first born out of your siblings? Like the oh, oldest? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, for sure. So yep. yeah, to, uh, to have that like almost... Um, both sides of the coin to mm -hmm. go from like city life to country life was yeah. probably crazy yeah even dude, as and, a kid yeah and that's like it was pretty extreme because we went to like both my parents were very into the business they were running which they took over from my grandma and um i spent a lot of time with my aunt growing up and my cousins okay and so we went from like having that type of lifestyle then to when we moved to dewey it was very important to my uh my mom to get more into like the countryside of things and she wasn't like a country like woman but she always had a passion for horses oh wow. and so that was like my first job was at like nine ten years old working at a barn whoa yeah and like i'm talking like a big barn like 60 horses oh, like shit. they throw horse shows and i'm hauling shavings and you know scooping up horse shit and whatnot so like it was pretty different. <laughs> yeah, so this, this wasn't like a farm that like you lived on or anything. It was like an actual like commercial farm that was just out there for someone else that you guys met yeah. or what, what was that? I don't, I'm not sure like job? how my mom. Yeah, I don't I don't know how like my mom kind of got the connections to do that. But it was a ranch in Dewey called Pain and Seven Ranch. And the ranch is still there. It's not named the same, but um, it was like a community ranch. Like okay. people could like, you know, have their you know, their professional horses come rent space and stalls and oh wow and whatnot. And then um my mom was just like doing all the um manual labor organization and management. And then, you know, having all like four boys. So I'm the oldest of four boys. Uh we'd all just go mob with my mom and do uh manual labor and That's crazy. <laughs> Yo, the, work on the, the ranch, <laughs> dude. So this was nine nineties or uh, yeah, yeah. So this was like yeah, in the like, maybe like late nineties. Yeah, mm -hmm. yo, that's so funny to be like late nineties country boy. Like yeah. <laughs> came from the city, like ten yep. years old, fucking picking up horse shit. Like, oh, dude, and it they did not care about labor laws or like like nah. like being old enough. No, dude, and like our payment. Like I remember we got a dollar a day. And, no. But that was awesome, though, because at the time there was a gas station like right off of Main Street. And it was like the only place you it was like a market, but yeah. like a gas station. Right, right. And uh, but like my brothers, like literally we'd save up all week, seven bucks and go buy Sobeys from the gas station. And that was Sobeys. like that was the thing. Dude, like, you know, so <laughs> Sobeys mm -hmm. are like one of the staples <laughs> of the 90s, dude. Like yeah. if you recognize glass, that logo, a the glass, glass Sobe, bottle. dude, that's when, not yeah. these plastic Sobeys they nah, got dude. nowadays. <laughs> yeah, the glass Sobe was different, dude. Like those days, dude, I'm sure there's people that have like collections of yeah, Sobe bottles. <laughs> like mm -hmm. it's one of those one of those uh like culture cultural items <laughs> yeah man because like sobe sponsored like the x games and all yeah. that stuff too and we were big on that so that was just you know it was kind of a highlight like when you're living in a small town like that like you don't get introduction to exposure like that like when you do in the city yeah and so you know point. tv's limited media's limited events com community gatherings are limited and so it was like those little things that were really special with me and my brothers growing up. Like, it sounds like to some people boring, but honestly, I loved the simple lifestyle yeah. and the appreciation of less. Yep. And so that was something that I really enjoyed. Um, I didn't know it, obviously, at the time. Like, I resent, I thought I had resented it literally up until like maybe five or so years ago. Cause I was like the kid who came from the like city to the yeah, country right. and I still wanted to be city. Yeah. Like I was still rocking, <laughs> like I'm about to say this on air right now, but I was wearing like G unit shoes, Hell yeah. like yeah. echo pants, you know, like that kind of stuff. Like hip hop I, kid. Oh yeah, dude. Like all that stuff, like slim shady, slim, slim, uh, shady. slim shady shirts. And, yeah. Oh, uh, whatnot. But um, yeah. it took. It was funny because, like, as I got older, I really started embracing the small town living, country culture kind of thing. So, like, I'm even wearing my Johnny Cash shirt right yeah. now. So, like, <laughs> yeah. um, 
Uh, but yeah, it was just interesting how things work out. So out in Dewey then, um, I know you said you were like into X game stuff. And mm -hmm. so was that kind of a thing where you guys always playing outside, especially back mm -hmm. in the day, there's no technology and shit like that. So nah, dude, especially out in the country. Nah, man, we didn't have TV. Like, and my parents were big on that too. Yeah. Like they were very into like entertaining yourself. Like there's four of you, like go play outside. Right. Um, we didn't even have video games until like, like I must've already been in high school before really? and i was never into video games um even till this day my younger brothers are very into video games but i i feel like right now it was like a privilege not to be given access to that because it allowed me to yeah go out, out, outside and explore yeah and so like me and my brothers were really big into like bmx skateboarding like any outside sport like baseball basketball you name it we did all of it wow and so and that was really important too because like when we got older or not i mean a part of our story there too is that we ended up getting homeschooled oh really yeah, yeah. so like That's the education fun. wasn't that good yeah. out there you know like arizona's already bad as it is and so in some of these smaller towns it's just not really focused on and i don't know if that was a part of my mom's decision to do that but she was really passionate about bringing us home and whatnot so it allowed me and my brothers to get really close i was only homeschooled really during my middle school years but for my brothers they were homeschooled a little bit more but yeah not like uh you know it's not like what some people may think like what homeschool does to you or whatnot like we we're still cultured and we still had friends and whatnot but we just weren't subject to uh that uh mundane teaching that was happening at the time yeah in the public school setting yeah yeah for yeah. sure yeah i'm sure it was like actual wild west yeah <laughs> like yep. crazy shit especially yep. in the 90s yeah it's different dude mm -hmm. uh man so um how long were you guys in dewey then we lived we lived in dewey for a minute um i guess like technically we're in a uh like a sub part of dewey which is called Poland junction but I don't, sometimes I don't even name it because no one knows where it is. <laughs> yeah, and like, then we moved to actual like central Dewey, I guess you can call it. And um, a couple years after that, and then we lived there in Dewey until I was like a sophomore in high school. Oh, wow. So for, for a pretty decent time. For sure. And then, um, and then we moved to Prescott Valley or I guess the back of Prescott Valley, like almost on your way to Jerome. Oh, really? Okay. So I don't know if you're familiar with going up like Mingus Mountain. No, I haven't. No. So it's uh, but if you ever go up to Jerome or whatever, you go through the windy roads of Mingus Mountain and Cottonwood and whatnot. And uh, but that's where we resided for a little bit. But I only lived there for a year and a half until I moved to Flagstaff to go okay. to NAU. Dude, I actually, I think I might know what like is that kind of like on the way to like Heber and all those places like in that fucking north yeah, kind east of yeah. Like instead world. of going uh towards there, like because I I don't know. I think you're talking about maybe Chino Valley. Maybe because I've I've driven to Michigan a few times, mm -hmm. so I've gone like up through like New Mexico. Oh, okay. So it's kind of like it kind of takes me into that that corner where like the elevation mm -hmm. gets super high. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I yeah. wish I could tell you. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm so bad at Arizona geography. Like I've been here for almost ten years, and I'm like so like phoenix metro area <laughs> like, Dude, that's like, all i know i've lived here my whole life and it was like i was telling you earlier like until i moved out here i just thought of all this entire area scottsdale mesa phoenix it was Glendale, just phoenix, it was just phoenix. <laughs> yeah. it's just other little sections it was all phoenix to me and it wasn't until i lived out here and i was like okay so yeah it's scottsdale or yeah that's glendale or that's mesa and yeah and that's paradise valley so, yeah and then you mm. get down here too and it's just kind of like oh man like all this is like 20 minutes away from each other but it's like yeah it's big but small mm -hmm. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like um so when you were in dewey did you uh did your parents have like disposable cameras or something like that or did your parents have like any type of like cameras or like was there any type mm. of uh like i don't know glimpse of your future like photography in, i mean not uh, honestly days? not really not in a camera format okay but art was always a big presence okay and so like i have to give it mostly to my mom uh was very much more on the creative side and you know very into to music and right. certain cinemas and um my family that i'm not very close to or uh you know that are just older past whatever uh we do have a lineage of artists Nice. Um, I don't know if it's like one of my like past like uncle once removed or something was an apprentice of Frank Lloyd Wright and um, one of my I don't know if it's like my great grandma 
or her sister or something was like another famous painter. And then, so I had acquired a lot of painting books early on and I was a big admirer of painting and sketching, uh, especially. And I got really into sketching, just, oh, wow. you know, uh, drawing, um, at like, I would say like maybe five, six years old. And then it amplified when we moved to Dewey and I got really into art and just sketching landscapes and horses and people. And, um, oh. I, uh. I pursued that for quite some time, like all the way up into high school. And then I always kind of just fell back to it a little bit. Like I was always the friend that drew everyone's tattoos or like, cause I knew how to sketch. And in college, I did minor in visual communication my entire time. And that was kind of a mix of art history, photography, uh, video and whatnot. And, um, but photography wasn't really like I honestly like hate to say I never really thought of photography until like I got to college. That's crazy. Yeah, it was yeah. actually um my brother, uh, second oldest brother uh, Jacob was actually the one who got in the film photography like way back in the day and learned on my grandpa's Minolta T two, which I have right now. Fuck yeah! And um I don't shoot on it, but you yeah, have you it know, though, yeah. yeah, I have yeah. it. Um. But he actually learned on that. And I actually have a role of his film that never got developed that I found in the camera that was from when he was learning on it, when he was like, he must've been seven or eight. Your brother? Yeah. Wow. And so, and I remember we had a little disposable that we shared. It was like a little like teal green one. That was cool when we took pictures and whatnot. But honestly, that's like my only memory of photography that early on. And it wasn't until I started studying media and honestly like marketing is kind of what got me into the appreciation of like visual arts in college yeah yeah and so yeah damn dude i mean it's it's kind of like a parallel um that you were into almost drawing portraits yeah. basically and then yeah. then you ended up taking portraits yeah <laughs> so it's like like the things that you were drawing like landscapes pictures yeah. of people pictures of things it's mm -hmm. like that's what you do now but in like mm -hmm. photo form so it's almost yeah. like you were always, you had like the eye for things. Yeah, like in a I'll, way. I'll definitely say that like having a way of seeing and composing has always felt natural to me. Yeah. Um. Whether, and that was something I instantly recognized that I was good at kind of, to, I guess to say is when I started doing video and like more cinematography type projects, um, it was something that I felt like I didn't have to work hard at at yeah. first. And so that made it, you know, that was almost like why I started to pursue it even more because I felt like I was good at it fast. Yeah. But that's not the reason I do it at all now. For sure. And so, but that's definitely how it started. For sure. Yeah. I mean, that's ex exciting to almost be progressing faster than you may have thought you could have, where it's mm -hmm. like it came to you almost naturally in a way. Like, yeah. It was almost like everything I was doing outside of photography was prepping me for photography. Yeah. Like drawing was teaching me how to compose and how to see contrast. Cinema was really teaching me more about storytelling. Yeah. And then, you know, studying the history and everything just kind of wrapped it together. And when I found the right tool, I was able to exercise all those skills into one thing, which is what happened to be a still camera. Yeah. And so it, it took a while to get to that point. But when it did, I felt like it was it was natural. Yeah, man, mm -hmm. I I love that and like kind of connecting those parallels where mm -hmm. you say like you were almost putting the work for being a photographer before you were actually a photographer. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. Mm -hmm. Rather than like not having an interest in art at all and then just like trying to start start right. up photo, like mm -hmm. that's yeah. I mean, that just kind of goes to the the core of you, which is like a, you're an artist. You yeah. know, it's like yeah, like it's hard to just label you as just like a straight up photographers mm -hmm. like you're a uh artistic <laughs> artistic storyteller with photos <laughs> yeah no i agree i agree and like <laughs> titles and labels i'm it's like some every artist i think struggles with because you don't want to be put in a box or whatever and that's something like i love the title of a photographer yeah but i do know like my intention and with how I'm going to use it is more than just taking photos. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the big, big, big thing, storytelling, like mm -hmm. that is a, a big thing that yeah. it's, uh, and that's, that's part of the art of mm -hmm. photography is right. storytelling. Exactly. So, um, dude, I fucking love that. So then <laughs> in NAU, then that's when you almost started to shift a little bit. Whereas it's kind of like, I can do this. And then at that point, 
that's kind of when you started Film is Dead. Is that right? Like around like 2016, is that right? Correct. Um, yeah, I graduated in 2015 and it actually started as a marketing company. Film so, is Dead. Um, yeah, and I okay. actually had it under a different uh, DBA as well. So I actually started it as um, Wondered Off Marketing Company. Mm. And I like the like, I think with Wondered Off, like I like the whole, like it was kind of always a inside joke between family and friends. Like, you know, I was like the stoner dude that would wander off in the woods. Like I was cool with being alone. I kind of just did my own thing and whatnot. And I liked how that name encompassed that characteristic of me. Yeah. And, but I never really truly liked the name. Yeah. And like, as I got like more mature in my career, like it only took a year. Yeah. And you're like, okay, <laughs> this is I'll, not going to work. <laughs> yeah. No. And I wanted something that was like more, you know, authentic to myself and what I wanted to do. And that also came about with what I was practicing and, and offering as services or products through my company was I didn't, I was kind of like a one stop shop. Yeah. And I did website, I did video and I did photography. And um, that's right when Facebook ads and stuff like Instagram was like barely a thing still. Yeah. And but that's when ads started becoming really big on social media and I knew how to do them. Yeah. And so it was like a really small like marketing firm in a way. And I had an uh, an internship with a uh, with a marketing group out in Flagstaff that did pretty well. But I quickly just became burnt out. And I found that I was using website and social media management. And I was, I was basically using marketing as an excuse to produce media. And I really loved cinema at the time. And I was actually pursuing more cinema than photography. Really? And then, but it was like all these things kept teaching me that I didn't want more distractions. I wanted less. Yeah. Like, cause I got really into the cinematography stuff with the color grading. Like I was really big into DaVinci Resolved and I had like the whole board. Oh, wow. With and, the color wheels and all that. Shit. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like I was really big into that and really learning how to edit and um, then getting into after effects and doing special effects and whatnot and 3d rendering. And that Damn. was very exciting for me at the time. But Honestly, it was the frustration of not having a computer that had a processor that was good enough to process all these graphics that kept holding me back. And I had a brother who ended up building a computer for me that ended up like killing it and doing all this stuff really well. But then I still, still, I was like looking for that simplicity. And so I kind of fell back to photography because I just loved the natural way of how still photography is. Yeah. It doesn't need the editing really and it doesn't need the software really and it doesn't need the post edits or any of that extraness i guess really and if you're able to execute something well in camera you don't really need to do anything after that absolutely and that's kind of like what triggered my i guess like my more modern mindset like what i have today with like finding more simplicity in my artwork and therefore having a higher execute a level a higher level of execution because i'm not distracted by these other nuances of what the final outcome is going to be yeah and so that kind of like inspired me to go into street photography and shoot more natural things instead of commercial work and then that led me to film and you know kind of going down the rabbit hole to where i'm at today so that was all while you were still in flag kind of right after right out of college yeah so mm -hmm. nice so you were still in flag for some time before you came to phoenix then yeah ultimately yeah we were there for um i think three years after i graduated um i graduated in 15 my girl graduated in 2016 and then my son was born in 2018 oh wow and then he was actually the primary catalyst that got us out of flagstaff wow and mm -hmm. that was when you uh, you were telling me earlier when you were uh, starting to get um, like you had two jobs and you were just running it and like yeah that, to get out yeah. of Flagstaff and to move to Prescott like we had we had to hustle yeah and so we like um, my lady's much better at than me at like finding homes and like executing the move and I'm very much the dreamer in the relationship and she's the executor and so she got us to Flagstaff and uh, we both got jobs. I was working two jobs. She was pregnant, working a job for t full time and um, just trying to do everything we can to like, you know, prep for the biggest moment in our lives. For sure. And um, and yeah, that kind of is like where like the beginning of my first taste of the cannabis industry started and um, but then furthered my career into marketing. Yeah, absolutely. And um, 
I, I kind of want to touch on like being a, a small business owner and mm -hmm. when you kind of realize that you're about to be a dad yeah. and like how that not only like changed your life, but like changed your mindset, like yeah. professionally and personally. Oh yeah. Um, like how, how big was that impact on you and like what kind of changes did you have to make in your life? I feel like I had to change everything um, because what I was doing at the moment wasn't sustainable. Um, I had no work-life balance. Mm -hmm. Everything was work. And I think, you know, every business owner, small or large, experiences that, you know, you're no longer just executing the tasks and services or products, but you're the accountant, you're the lawyer, you're making sure all your other stuff is good to go. And um, I needed something that was a little bit more, you know, concrete. Yeah. You know, any freelancer can relate, you know, some, some months you're killing it. Some months you don't make anything. And that wasn't something I wanted to risk or a stress that I wanted to put on my my growing family. Yeah. And I had the skill set and the background to perform something that was like higher paying and more concrete. So so I, that's what I did. I made that decision to go back into marketing full time because at that point I had been freelancing for almost two years. Wow. And so it was, you know, it was a humbling experience for me to be like, hey, you know what? I'm going to take a step back from my craft use this skill set towards something else, but I'm going to come back to it. Yeah. And so I never even say that, I, I always say I'm a full-time photographer still. And so even though these days I don't do as much work for commercial as I used to, I still shoot every day. Like my, my camera's bag is in your kitchen right now. Yeah. Literally, I have my camera on me 24-7. Yeah. And that's the work that really inspires me now is sometimes the photograph worth taking may have been a moment that you would have never been prepped for. And that's a big part of it is being ready. And you yeah. never know when that is. So yeah, stay strapped. Dude, I love <laughs> it, dude. <laughs> Yo, and touching on the business, um, Film is Dead Studio. Mm -hmm. So um, first off, Film is Dead, obviously, you know, that's because film, like you shoot film. And yes. was that something that was... Um, because, I mean, you started on digital. You were shooting mm -hmm. on Sony, like, A-series. Mm -hmm. uh, and w did you kind of have, like, a point in time where you were, like, a hybrid digital and film and then just, mm -hmm. like, went all in on film? And what was that transition like? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, even kind of going back to the whole name switch, trying to do something that was a little bit more true to, like, my being, um, Film is Dead came about with the it's a paradox yeah you know it's it, it's obviously not a dead medium right but for something to have be have been like evolved past with digital it's it did see a death point like or else people wouldn't be saying it yeah and so i thought i liked the idea of having a paradox of well what if i like had a brand that basically used this paradox and used it as like hey like the majority of people think that this medium is dead, but I'm using it to like, this is my bloodstream of this business. Yeah. And even if it's not like full, full time and it's paying for like my house and my cars and you know, my kid and whatnot and my family, but it's still like something that's being used to support a full-time endeavor with a medium that most would presume dead. Yeah. And I, I loved that, that. That is cool. Um, And I loved the whole like purist aspect of it too and it kind of just calls it out right away um like yeah film is dead but that's where i shoot full time yeah. and so and um but yeah and so like going into film from digital um yeah i was a hybrid shooter for a long time because i was still shooting digital for a lot of commercial work and trying to transition people into allowing me to shoot film on sets and at gigs and whatnot and film had like a very like weird perception at that time before it started trending yeah and so because this is all like 2016 through 18 19 ish so before like because i think covid really amplified the trend of film, film for sure in that moment like it really started taking off but before this, like I was like, you know, sending my film out of state to get developed. Like the dark room lab was like the first big film lab that was being recognized and people were going out of their way to show up their film to. Yeah. And uh, but I shot on digital mostly for commercial work and then film for personal work. And then I was doing some hybrid gigs. And then it was only like a year and a half ago that I decided to go all film. Oh, really? Yeah. So you were doing the hybrid thing for, for some time then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And like it 
it got to a point where like the commercial work I was still doing were gigs that were just like, it was just extra cash in the bank. Yeah. Like they weren't passion projects. Like I was still shooting like architecture or just like random gigs that, you know, paid the bills. Yeah. And they just wanted quick, clean cut, digital, you know, unedited type stuff. Like yeah. it's not even work I would show today. Yeah. Not that it wasn't good, but it's just work that doesn't have any, you know, uniqueness to it. Right. And so, um, but I had a digital camera, but I didn't, I haven't shot digital in years. <laughs> yeah. Like I would say probably since 2020. Yeah. Like, um, like I kept the digital cameras for just in case. And I think I did one gig and I kept, I, then I, I sold all my Sony stuff and I ended up going down to a Fuji X100V and I loved that thing. And I only shot on it like a couple of times and then it collected dust for like two years and then I sold it to, uh. Nick Weber. Oh yeah, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Full circle. Yep. <laughs> Episode yep. five. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I thought it was perfect to sell to him because he's actually one that sold me my Leica M6 that I shoot on right now. Yeah, and that was actually a question that I'm glad. Good, good segue. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, when when did you get your Leica, and also like how did that change like your uh, film photography? But I mean, because that's like the pinnacle of yeah like film photography is like and how yeah. like great and you know just i guess consistent and also they hold their value if you take care of them and like just, mm -hmm. yeah like is just top of the top of the class <laughs> yeah man i won't say anything about it like it's the best camera in the world you know like <laughs> yeah. um and that's why i wanted to pursue it and that's why i sold all my gear i had you know the sony a7r2 g master lens i had all the gimbals i had all the road mics i had all the drones and I sold all of that for a good chunk of change, and I used that to buy my first Leica M6, um, which wasn't from Wilson. Um, I got it off of uh, of eBay, Ooh, and risky. Um, it, yeah, risky. And of course, like you know, it worked perfect. Fell in love with it, and then something happened where I had to send it in um, to a Leica repair, and the guy who was working on it basically said like the part that needed to be fixed he couldn't get in a timely manner, so he ended up buying it off of me. And then it just so happened to be the exact same weekend that I like kind of was forced to sell my uh, first M6. I saw a uh, an explore page like on Instagram of uh, another M6. And so I clicked on it and it was uh, from a local film lab right next to where I was living in Scottsdale, Wilson Camera. Wow. And I don't know if Nick even owned it yet. Um, I, but depending I, on when it was. I feel yeah, it was I like can't remember. Yeah, because he was uh, what did he say he got it. Cause know? I think it was like COVID time that that's okay. when he made the move to like okay, get so it. Yeah, he must have like just got it or something. Okay. So like, but he uh, I messaged him on Instagram and he was like, "Yeah, man, come in and look at it." And went and looked at it the next day, and then I was like, "Hey, like this is my situation. I'm not gonna get the money until like a couple days for the transfer or whatnot." And he's like, "Yeah, man, if it's still here over the weekend, like just come back and we'll see what we can do." And so I go in uh, the following like Monday and it's not there. It's not on the shelf. And I'm just like, you know, having an internal freak out. I'm like, God, I'm never going to get that situation again. Because something ah. I didn't say was this thing's in perfect condition. Yeah. Never seen something so well kept in real life. And it was it was the same owner, um, some older lady, barely shot on it. Like the thing looked brand new. Wow. Still even has like, if you know, familiar like a shooters you'll know the little sticker label on the or protector on the bottom most of the times it ain't on there it's all you know shaved down to the brass and whatnot um but this one still had like the label on it clean no dents no anything wow and um and i go and i'm like dude did it so and he's like no nah, man check this out and he had it hiding in the back wow and we didn't even know each other really like that yet and he was like, uh, yeah, man, I just, I knew you were that person. I knew it was meant for you. And if you had come back today, he's like, I knew I was going to save it for the right person. And wow. so got it on the spot. Haven't looked back since. <sighs> and so, yeah, and that, he's always held a special, you know, a special part of my heart because of that moment. So, for sure. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's a big thing, man. Yeah. Shout out Nick for that. That's, that's yeah. fucking awesome, man. Yeah. And I mean, you've been working with them exclusively since oh, then. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. 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 We've built a really tight relationship. Um, just nothing but respect for the art. And 
it was really nice to see people taking over a lab and shop that actually like cared about the craft yeah as well as the people within the community that you know perform the craft absolutely and so like you know knowing what wilson has done in the community and for the people who shoot and do whatever they're you know i think it's something that's never really been done before yeah and um i respect that and i appreciate that because i want to be able to do what i do now if it wasn't for that lab for sure so yeah and i and i really do think that they they shook things up in the scene here mm -hmm. quite a bit when they took that over oh yeah um, yeah, because I mean, even in the time that he's had it, they've made so many strides mm -hmm. and like got so like put so many people on as well. Like, yep. Because I, I feel like that was the biggest thing is uh, people weren't shooting because it was like not as easy to like shoot and get things developed and all that shit. Yeah. So to have like a, a local lab that was not only like super passionate about it, mm -hmm. it was like like being quick about mm -hmm. it and like deving every day and shit yeah. like that like it got to a point where they started generating so much new business mm -hmm. because of what they were doing so yeah oh, yeah, yeah now they gotta actually made. wait like two days for my <laughs> scans to come back <laughs> <laughs> it's like man I'm, this is not gonna be the next two hours bro like yeah i'm spoiled the day. i'm spoiled now <laughs> yeah. i remember when he first started do, when they first started doing that whole turnaround stuff because i'm used to like you know i shipped my film out right I'd wait, you, you like, wait like weeks. weeks yeah yeah and then yeah like you know god forbid that they actually came back good yeah and whatnot and uh that was something i've grown really close with all the guys over there and they've been a, a big they played a big part in um me pursuing film and and using it as a full-time endeavor and but um kind of going back to like the Leica question that was something that when I was like I had already been shooting with like what I considered one of the better digital cameras like for, sure. for mirrorless and kind of like in that re you know without shooting a red or something right um but uh so if I was going to sell all that and if I had already made my mind up that if I was going to pursue film I wanted it to do it in the most I guess, uh, what's the word? like just like natural way. Yeah. And so I didn't like, again, I just didn't want any distractions. And so I started researching all these different cameras. Cause at the time I had like, I had a con, I also had a Contax T2. Um, I had a Nikon F3, which was like my favorite at the time. Yeah. And you Canon AE1. And then I collected Classic. a bunch of other cameras and I was just like doing research on like, you know, what, what's something out there that's like literally the purest form. And it just so happened to be a Leica. Like the price point is what it is. But I also respect that because they're one of the few camera companies that actually focus on the integrity of the craft. Yeah, They don't add more stuff to it. They just fine tune what they've already created, which is all you need. Yeah, Like you have a shutter, you got your winder, you got your f-stop your lens and that's it and you control all of it so if Fully you're manual yeah yeah if you're if your photos underexposed it's because of you if you're if it's overexposed out of focus or ever how it is want to be however you want to judge your photo it's because you had a hundred percent control of the outcome of that photo yeah. and i loved that i loved the challenge of it and it was kind of like something i was saying earlier when i was shooting on digital specifically that setup for digital it felt too easy to achieve what I wanted out of it. And it, then it didn't feel right. Yeah. I, I started getting really into printmaking and I wanted to get into books and more storytelling. And I loved the photos I was taking, but I didn't really like the way I was doing it because it didn't feel like I earned it. Mm. Like I have one street photo that I still have that I don't really share, but it's, it's one of my favorites, but it was also one of the easiest photos I ever shot. And on film uh on digital or on digital okay yeah and that was it was one it was it was that photo too that was also like one of those it was just a reminder of what of how i didn't want to do it yeah like i felt the taste of like almost, it's like when you face the taste of winning but it's like yeah but it's not like you cheated but i took that pre-workout before and that's why i ran faster or something mm -hmm. like that so yeah. it doesn't feel like you got it that kind of way totally and that's a total like personal internal kind of experience and whatnot and some people may relate or may not um, cause I usually get like feedback with like, oh, that's just like a purist intention and whatnot. Like you could still do it and it still means the same, but it doesn't to me. For sure. Yeah. And I mean, that's kind of like with the argument of like digital versus film where you have to be so much more intentional when you're shooting mm -hmm. film versus with digital, you can just kind of like auto some of those settings and just yeah. fire it off and just pick through 15 mm -hmm. different images, edit it mm -hmm. to make sure it looks exactly like you want. Oh and yeah. There's so much 
so much more you can do to a digital image. So I, yeah. yeah, and I think that says a lot about um, your dedication to the intention of mm -hmm. the art making of photography. And right. um, yeah, and I want to like on the vein since we're talking about like a you you have this thing where it's like one camera, one lens. Yeah, you know, that type of deal, and that's the thirty-five millimeter. It's the the Sumilux or something like that, or like uh, what kind of Summicron would be my uh, my my favorite. Um, I like the Summilux. I don't need the only difference is like a couple elements in the lens, and then it has you know a couple extra f stops. But I don't really shoot that low of light. Okay, um, it goes down to f two for people who don't know about those lenses, and a Summilux goes down to one point four. But um, yeah, that's what I'm shooting on now. Uh, I actually have a, another German lens I use. It's not a Leica lens. Okay. But again, another shout out. Nick Weber has me on the 35 Summicron right now yeah. on the lease. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> so yeah, those lenses aren't cheap either. So. For sure. Mm -hmm. But that's the the go-to for everything that yeah, you shoot. I, yeah. It was kind of like what I enjoyed about having a zoom lens was also like what I didn't like about it was the, it was too easy. Yeah. The way to compose and zoom and, and go out, I was like, you know, one camera, one lens, this will give me a better opportunity to master a specific skill set. And when I was like, and that's kind of why I got the Fuji X100V because even though it's 28 millimeter, it's crop sensor, so it's more like 35. Oh, I see. And so I wanted to really see like how I responded to only shooting 35. Yeah. And so I shot, that's literally the only reason I got the Fuji X100V was to prep myself to see if I would like a Leica. Yeah. And um and that's even been like a dis like a a thing that I've been working against is like oh do I shoot 28 or 35 but um I love 35. I think it's the perfect crop. It's it's wide angle but yet it's in enough where I can frame and compose properly. For sure, especially so. for the types of things that you're shooting. It's very right. versatile. You mm -hmm. know, it can be a portrait lens but it can also be like wide angle-ish if you're doing landscape or yeah. building photography stuff like that. It's like mm -hmm. yeah, 50, 35 like both of those are kind of the go-tos for mm -hmm. a lot of people. Yeah. Um but to have that 30 that's David's I think David said like his favorite is 35 mm yeah, like that focal length too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um yeah, and I I like what you said where it's kind of like honing in on one thing and just getting mm -hmm. really good at it yeah i think that's um i don't know there's something there's something to be said about that because like rather than trying to be like good at shooting all these things you're like well i'm gonna focus on doing this one thing very well and right. that kind of became like your brand in a way yeah it, is, it was like i was a jack of all trades for such a long time i was like I'm, try I'm tired of trying to be good at 10 different things. I just want to be really, really good at one thing. Right. And like, and that literally was my entire creative process from starting off, you know, the marketing company, working with all these different skill sets and dialing it all the way to just still photography, to just film, to one camera, one lens, to now have it where it's at. And I feel like any artist could relate once you reach this moment is like you have your rhythm. Yeah. You have your tools that you know that you can use to execute what it is you want to execute. And now all you have to do is do it more. Yeah. And you just keep practicing and getting, you know, better and more understanding every day with it. Yeah, absolutely, man. And it's kind of like a jack of all trades, um, like becomes like a master of none type deal. Exactly. Like that, that same type of mindset. Mm -hmm. Hey, Martians, real quick. I appreciate you taking the time to listen or watch wherever you are in the world. Over the last few months, the Martian family has grown so much. I could not be more thankful for all of my guests and every single one of you who continue to tune in every single week. Subscribers, ratings, likes, and comments all help us grow here on Mars. And it would mean the world. If you haven't already, please go to onmarspod.com slash subscribe to subscribe on YouTube. Like and leave a comment. Rate us on Spotify. All this good stuff helps keep the engine running to inspire Martians all over the world. P.S. Follow us on Instagram at OnMarsPod. Okay, let's get back to it. So something that is kind of part of your brand is almost like a photojournalistic type of photography where it's like yeah. documentary storytelling is big um, mm -hmm. and like street photography, things like mm -hmm. that. Um, so can you just talk about like infusing that? Cause we were kind of talking about this earlier already, but how that was something that you went into it with that intention because of your interest in like cinema mm -hmm. and just kind of taking that into 
uh, into account when you're talking about your photography is mm-hmm. make, like telling a story mm-hmm. with composition and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, so just kind of talk about that, how it's like capturing a moment and what that, like how that's uh, so important to your your craft. Yeah, I think some of the most important stories are what's naturally happening every day, um, unawareingly. Or if that's even a word, yeah, uh, yeah. unconsciously, Uncon- I guess yeah. is more where it just is what I was looking flies for. Flies by, you don't even think about it. Type exactly, stuff. Yeah. and that you know, it's not that we don't, as people, it's not like we don't appreciate those moments, but we're so caught up in our everyday, our own realities, we don't really have time or energy to look outside of that. Yeah, and so with street photography and documentary photography, you're really hyper focusing on those elements. And that's, again, like if you're going to be shooting and capturing people's lives, you need to have a certain level of respect. Yeah. Um, You know, you don't know what these people are going through and why they're at with what they're at. And to, you know, to go into their personal space, you need to come with respectful intentions. And I thought film was also a perfect complement to that uh, kind of perception or what I was trying to go for. And, um, yeah, kind of, again, just with the whole conversation of like digital, making it like just too easy or, uh, um, almost, uh, I lost the word for it, but anyways, um, how film complements the authenticity of the storytelling really in respect to the people that you're shooting. Yeah. And that's something I notice today. A lot of people are very quick, especially with street photography. All they see is the the close-up, the action shot, the outcome. And what I think is like a bad trend today is people not really understanding that respect level. And they go out on the streets and they just like, you know, we'll blast people in the face and whatnot. And, you know, I won't sit up here and act like I'm not like, be like a hypocrite. I shoot people with flash, shoot them in the face too. But it's having an intention behind it and at least having a game plan too if you're going to get called out. Yeah, And I feel like a lot of people don't do that. And in respects to street photography and documentary photography, I just, again, I loved how film complements to the authenticity of the storytelling. Absolutely. And it makes you work harder for it. I think ultimately it helps, like if you have the people who you're documenting involved in the project, then they also see like, hey, like this is something that's being pushed a little bit further with different formats that is not... I guess what you would consider like an orthodox way nowadays. Yeah. So that was something I really loved about just like kind of bringing film and street photography and documentary photography together. For sure. And it's almost like because with film, you have to be so intentional that Mm -hmm. really captures that moment like Mm -hmm. to like that exact second. Yeah. Which is, I think, so cool because as soon as you hit that shutter, it's burned on the thing and you're yeah. not going to know how it turned out until you develop it. That's the, yeah. <laughs> that's the cool thing yep. about film where it's just like you can basically tee it up and mm-hmm. like do everything in your power to hit that thing right. And then if you fuck up one little thing, yeah. you won't know until you, <laughs> you yeah, develop You know, it. that is kind of cool to have on the streets too because you, yeah. you know, you'll get that person who's like, oh, what you're taking a picture of and whatnot. It's like, ah, sorry, man, it's film. Like, I got nothing to show. Yeah, you. right. <laughs> it's just like, you show them the back, just like, no it's screens like, ah, here. Sorry, man, I don't even know what I shot. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I don't even know. It. Like, I was, <laughs> Yo. I'm like, I don't know, man. I'll let you know when you get developed. You want my, you want my card? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, but it's it also is like kind of like a conversation thing too, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Like when you're in the streets, like talking about like, oh, I'm shooting film. Like yeah. I'm sure a lot of people are like, oh shit, like that mm-hmm. looks like a retro camera. <laughs> oh yeah, dude. And when yeah. you have the, you know, people who are like, if you're in photography, you know what a Leica is. For you sure. know what the red dot means. And yeah. definitely there's a reason why, like I cover mine up. For, I, yeah, I, smart, I put a little, yeah. You know, and a lot of people do. It's yeah. not new or anything, but like I'll put a little black piece of tape on it because it's it's definitely a conversation starter yeah. and sometimes in good and not so good ways because <laughs> yeah, yeah, people yeah. know their value and yeah. whatnot and you're trying you, to swipe you oh yeah you're wearing like a little damn near little car on your neck yeah <laughs> and uh but it's cool when you get the uh um the film and like retro camera like infused enthusiasts 
with it like i always get hit up by old dudes yeah yeah like they're like oh is that a like oh is that that's one of the m oh is that m6 oh, yeah. oh man i used to have one back in the 90s yeah, the, <laughs> when they came out yeah, <laughs> yeah. whatever like <laughs> talking about it like that yeah like one of my favorite uh groups is uh in prescott and there's a bunch of old timers i've only met up with them once um but they're just a bunch of old dudes all 60 plus they all shoot very very strict leica shooters they almost wow. didn't let me in the club because I, I didn't have a leica lens yet at the time wow and so yeah <laughs> this is the- <laughs> and but they're all like none the of them elite. were really like professional photographers but they were all like ex-marine and like navy seals that just had their cameras on deck during that time so they have like some of the most incredible photos i've ever seen Damn. and um but they meet very exclusively and whatnot and um hopefully i'll get invited <laughs> back soon but i've only been to one <laughs> <laughs> dude i didn't even know there was those like elite level of photography groups like specifically like a film yeah groups. dude and i met one of them super random i was photographing the prescott uh fourth of july parade and he uh i was like shooting in the middle of the square and i hear like this yelling in my ear and the dude and i like look over i'm like is this guy yelling at me like what's going on he's like Hey, you with the Leica. <laughs> and then I look around his neck. He's he also was shooting with an M6. Oh wow. And so like we started talking and um, but yeah, he's like 70 years old and we literally chatted for like an hour and a half. Damn, dude. Yeah. And I was like, sorry, man, I'm actually working yeah. right now. Like I actually have to go shoot some stuff and uh whatnot. But he told me about the group and then I met up with them later that day. And then uh, but I only can stay in contact with them over Facebook. And yeah. I'm not really ever on me- Facebook Messenger. And so it's kind of just, we've kind of just grown away because that was like a year and a half ago or so. But Yo. yeah, the Leica community is uh, is different, but very interesting. For sure. So yeah, but it's almost like if you see another person that is into it, it's almost like that instant connection. Just like we oh, could yeah. talk about this for oh, a minute. Yeah. <laughs> because I feel like for people who don't agree or have that like because everyone has like i think a fault or i don't know well i don't want to say false but they have a different perception of what leica means right like for a lot of people even photographers it's like oh it's just an expensive camera it doesn't mean anything like you can shoot with any camera and yes that's true you can shoot with any camera but you're not connecting yeah. you're not you know when you shoot with your iphone a lot of people don't understand that a lot of the settings in the iphone are stolen pre setups from like what Lightroom and what you did back in the day with Darkroom. Right. Like all those filters are legit light processes that you can do in the Darkroom and now you just apply filters on it. Right. And so like, and there's no connection. And again, it kind of just goes with that ease of access. It's so easy. There's no respect. For and you sure. can hear it in people's tone. Like, oh, well, I can just take that picture of my phone. I'm like, yeah, I know you can. That's the issue. <laughs> that, exactly. Like you're not connecting with anything at that point if you're going to be looking at it like that. And, you know, it just so happened to be that the camera that helped me feel that was the most expensive camera you can buy. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, for sure. And that's like a good a good point and kind of brings me to the next thing that I wanted to bring up because earlier, I think we were talking about this before we started filming, um, shooting for the sake of the art of photography versus shooting for the sake of like posting content on Instagram. Right. And it's almost like when you talk about like shooting on your iPhone, like how many photos do you fucking shoot on your iPhone that you never even look at? Yeah. You know what I mean? Where it's almost Mm -hmm. like we take it for granted so much that we just like, if we see something cool we want to take a picture of, Mm -hmm. rifle it off and Mm -hmm. then look at that picture maybe six months from now and be like, oh, that was a cool like time or whatever but oh yeah like how many photos you got in your iphone right too now? many dude, dude that, Twenty thousand plus yeah exactly <laughs> it's like stupid. exactly it's, it's dumb and so, yeah you know that's a part of it <laughs> yeah dude, <laughs> for sure so uh, i wanted to bring that up because um you in 2020 you uh released uh your first photo book sweet gasoline yeah, yeah. And was that a lot of digital photos or was that like a mix of film and digital i would say it's a it's like a good half and half half and half okay yeah and that was like a really big testing like passion project it was like you know in covid times i had a lot of time on my hands but turning something into like a full-on execution of uh of a project storytelling you know tying something together like that was something that was very that is very important to me and I wanted to do and um with like you know just trying to get it up and going uh I only ended up uh getting 25 made oh wow so it was very exclusive yeah. oh yeah yeah I didn't because I didn't really honestly I didn't really know how I felt about it yeah um 
I felt like the photographs were good. I felt like the theme of the project might have been a little bit forced and because of how easy it was to shoot what I was shooting. Yeah. Um, and I didn't feel like that was like what is exactly what I wanted to be known for putting out in the world. But I, I still felt like it was like good enough where I'm like, I need to test the waters. Like I need to do something to get out of my comfort zone because I need to learn something about this right here. Like, why am I feeling this way? Yeah. And um, like I even partnered up with a good friend of mine, uh, Darius, and he wrote all the words in the book because I kind of collaborated it with, I gave him all the photographs and he wrote several poems oh, wow. about okay, it cool. and uh, kind of just give it a little bit more uh, context. And um, I really, he's a lyricist and he's a, he's an artist. And so I wanted to get him involved in that. But um, yeah, it was an exclusive project, um, but it was something that I needed to do to kind of tip my, you know, kind of like dip your toes in the water kind of thing and get involved in that publishing world because that's also the next step is as an artist photographing whatever is sharing your art with the world and how do you do that? Yeah. And I wasn't satisfied with sharing it on social media. Exactly. Um, I had done the influencer role back in the day and kind of like started over to rebuild like my profile and whatnot. And um, I wanted to go a different route. And so that's like where the books and the zines were really important. And I love the zines. The two zines I did release during that time were all shot on film. Nice. And, um, you know, it's uh, funny to say a lot of those fo uh, photos, some of them were even scanned by Walgreens. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, and I don't even have the negatives back for them because they don't give you back the negatives. Right. Those are one of the pictures you waited three weeks for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so like, yeah, I couldn't use dark, uh, dark room laugh for everything um, at that time. But uh yeah, that was a pretty exclusive drop, but it taught me a lot. It taught me on what kind of work I wanted to put into an, to my next full-fledged project, which right now I am partnering up with a, an actual publicist um, or a publisher. And um, we're right now kind of working on curating what is to be my main project that I'm working on right now, which is Beautiful Wasteland. Nice. And that's a, it's a geographical portrait of Phoenix and the surrounding areas. Um, but I'm kind of hyper focusing on the communities within and how they're similar yet different between the masses. Nice. So kind of playing off my perception of a lot of people, even if you lived in Arizona your whole life, like you kind of look at Phoenix as the same. You don't really see the differences between Mesa and Glendale or like, you know, just the west side, east side, south side, whatnot. And so what really interested me was, well, what if I focus like in the center and kind of start documenting to my way out and kind of string together the differences, we get the similarities between cultures and that a lot of what we're experiencing is only different because of geographical placement, not necessarily with what we're experiencing in reality. Wow. And so I, I, lo I love that. Yeah. And so I've been working on that project for three years. Damn. So that was, some, that was my biggest learning lesson with Sweet Gasoline was I published it too soon. I wanted to get a project done. I wanted to publish it during COVID because I had nothing else going on. Uh, I mean, like work-wise. And um, as far as my art goes, and so that was like a big lesson for me was when I release something else, I want it to be meaningful in a way that I also put as much work and effort into it. I knew that I could. Yeah. And I wanted to work with more people on it too. That was a complete solo. I designed the book, all that stuff by myself. And um, I want to be able to see what other people have to offer because it's not about you. And that kind of goes to why I have my company as Film Is Dead Studio and not Christian Markham photography is because I didn't want it to be about me. I wanted it to be about my art. And so these next projects, I have a few that I'm working on. And if you go to my website, you can see multitudes of them, some larger, some smaller, but these are all projects I've been spending years on. Wow. And I've only shared glimpses really through social media. The majority of my photos are on my website. Yeah, for sure. Film is dead dot studio. If you yes. want to check it out, yeah, yeah. <laughs> pause this video, go check them out, come back, <laughs> get some prints. Um, so uh, that's uh, that new photo series that you're working on. Are you planning on printing that into a book as well? I said, I know you said you were working with uh, publishers, so you're yeah. you're you're gonna actually do the whole book as well. Yeah, yeah. Nice, so dude. beautiful wasteland will be a full book, um, like linen bound Very and nice. whatnot. We're not into the designing process yet because I've fail to find an ending point um just because you know time's kind of like your enemy in a sense of there's specific events i would like 
to be in the series. Oh, included in it. Yeah. yeah. And so like I love shooting events, um, not the event itself, but I love shooting the people and their experience of that event. Yeah. And so um, between Beautiful Wasteland and then my other geographical portrait, which is everybody's uh, everybody's hometown, which is in Prescott, um, I just got to wait for things to happen. Yeah. And so I have a, uh, I'm hoping to release it either at the end of this year or the beginning of next year. Both of them are just beautiful wasteland. Just beautiful wasteland. And okay. then everybody's hometown will come pretty much right after that. Cause nice. that one, I'm just waiting for a few, again, some events to happen, se like seasonal. And then um, I'll have the context that is necessary, I think, to complete the story that's being told. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest thing about it The is the story. And the reason why it's taking you so long is because mm -hmm. you're being very intentional about what photos you're mm -hmm. curating for this mm -hmm. and almost telling stories and telling, uh, mm -hmm. especially with the event things. I think that's um, kind of goes back to what we were saying about like capturing a moment in time yeah. where like people enjoying their time, being mm -hmm. entertained or whatever they're at and just having having a good time being somewhere that they that they like purposely went. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. like when people go to events, it's because they made time for it. So to yep. kind of capture that moment, I feel like is mm -hmm. just storytelling in itself. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah and sometimes you just like, I love just sitting there and like not taking photos. Sometimes you're just observe, you're absorbing the energy that people are giving out because it, it's literally just pure joy. Most of the time, there's no distractions or obligations. It's, I went out of my way to come here to enjoy the moment and that's what I'm going to do. And it's enjoyable to be around an atmosphere like that. And I love photographing that. Yeah. And mm -hmm. sometimes I'm sure that you've had a lot of uh, events where you've gone to that you would not have gone to if you weren't planning on shooting it. Yeah, probably not. Like, and that that's something I kind of give kudos to photography too, is kind of like opening me up to that because I'm very introverted. I'm not, I don't really go out of my way to be in the scenes and to like, I guess, you know, it's kind of a downfall, but I don't go out of my way to like really nurture my relationships with people. Like I'm very much like, I'll hit you up. Like we're always good, but I don't really talk to people like that all too much. And I don't go out of my way to go out. Like, especially these days, I'm very much like I'm at home with my family. Exactly. That's like, a big part of it. Yeah. yeah. Like the only person that gets the majority of my time is my lady and my son. Yeah, And then everything else is just like whatever I have left. And if you happen to be a part of photography thing, then you're bettering your chance at, <laughs> you know, having me be involved in it. For sure. Um, but I'm enjoying that time right now. Yeah. And I think it's given me a little bit different perspective when I do go to these things. And uh, yeah, I just see them differently now. For sure, man. And I like that you're kind of um, almost keeping like physical media alive in both mm -hmm. like shooting film, but then also turning it into print works and mm -hmm. like printing these photos out. And cause that's another thing yeah. that I think is going to potentially have a resurgence just as much as like film had a resurgence. I think mm -hmm. printing film photos are going to yeah. definitely have like a resurgence and yeah. getting the full role in print form versus just yep. getting scans. Oh yeah. I, I saw it like really early or I mean, not early on, but like, it's been a couple of years now, but what's that company? Uh, I think it's called Darkroom, and you can set up a print shop. Oh, uh, in Phoenix, or, or no, it's, a, it's oh. just a website. Oh, it's a website. Yeah, you set up your profile, and um, and this kind of goes into like you know, it's nice when there's ways of easily achieving something, but when it's done without discipline, it's just getting taken advantage of. Yeah, and that's where I believe or like how I feel about printmaking is really the same how I feel about shooting film photography and all that. Like I'm very particular about what paper I print on and all this yeah. stuff. And that's not really saying like anyone who wants to print anything has to go about it like that. But I do think people need to be aware of the kind of respect you need to like print something. Like I don't agree with anybody being able to print anything. And so I feel like you have to put some work and some effort and some research to go about it. Yeah. Um, so, cause now you got people like, you know, they just got a camera last week. They go shoot this, that, and third. Now they got a, a print shop, you know, and what it really is doing, even though it is embracing to some extent new creativity, you're diluting and watering down the integrity of every artist that has laid down the bricks before you. Right. 
And so that's something that's important to me in my craft and not everybody has to follow that same journey, but it is something that I do try to at least bring awareness to. Yeah. It's like, hey, like, yeah, you can do that, but check yourself really quick to see if that is where your work is at yet. And if you are doing a service to the craft as a whole, because that's really how I, I like to approach stuff nowadays is like, is this benefiting me or is this, bit, or is this benefiting the game of photography? Right. And so, and when you find yourself doing it for something bigger than yourself, you go about things differently. Yeah. It's about why some people don't always care about winning. Like if you want to compare it to sports, sometimes winning the biggest game is because you're playing the game right. You're not trying to win. You're just playing the best game. You're doing it for the game. And so that's something I brought from like basketball. I learned in that, um, brought it over to photography. Dude, I, I like that parallel a lot where it's, it's almost like, and that kind of just shows like the fact that it even something, it's something that bothers you to a certain degree <laughs> that kind of like shows like yeah. your, your passion and your care for the art of photography. Mm -hmm. It's just like, just because in kind of like what we were saying off camera a little bit, like just yeah. because you have a photographer or a camera doesn't mean you're a photographer. Just because you have a paintbrush doesn't mm -hmm. mean you're a painter. Right. So I think like uh, almost having intention with what you're doing and having mm -hmm. a respect for exactly. the industry that you're in and, and the people that, like you said, kind of laid those bricks before you. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really big deal when it comes to any type of creative endeavor, but mm -hmm. specifically in, you know, film now that it's like a popular thing to do. You know? Yeah. Like, that's yeah, and the, the you know, tough part. <laughs> yeah, and like I want to be clear, like it's not like people don't deserve. Like everyone deserves a well. Everyone gets a chance to pursue something, but to continue to pursue it and be self aware and yeah, it's just all about respect. Is yeah. is really like what's important? What I try to bring awareness to when I talk to other people about photography, especially with just with what I've observed in today. Now that it is a trending type of format and whatnot, so. Yeah. And I'm sure like whenever you have those conversations, people can see like the passion just ooze out of you. <laughs> just like I mean, dang, I would hope so. Or they just think I'm grilling them. So. <laughs> yeah, they take it all personally. <laughs> yeah, which I, I always find it's myself like, I'm like, you know, about like me? I'm not like that's not like what I mean. I don't mean it like in that kind of like way of like, oh, well, you can't do this. And if you don't do it this way, right. I'm just saying um people do that because of the ease of access that you now have to it. A yeah, lot of people wouldn't it. be film photographers if it wasn't trending, if it wasn't so easy to buy, if it wasn't so easy to get scanned, you would have never probably dabbled in this format. So yeah. that's just something that's not good or bad. That's just something to be self-aware about. For sure. You know, like I got into photography, not because of photography but it was because of marketing yeah. and i noticed like how to compose and i knew how to take certain photographs or videos to manipulate people in advertising to get them to buy a product like that ain't the best way to start off into this you know purest art crap purest art form either but you know evolving past that being aware and self-conscious and then rededicating yourself to that respect that your craft needs is something that i've you know, I now try to, yeah, really capitalize on. For sure. And and push that, that love of the art. And I think yeah. that's like with your, like your intention when you say these things, it's not mm -hmm. to like put anyone down, but it's almost to like let them know like, mm -hmm. yes, get into it, but don't get into it because it's trending. Don't yeah. get into it just because like you want to show on Instagram uh, film scan or something like that and yeah. then like throw it away later. You know, like I think that's the biggest thing too where it's like having the intention and the love of the art as mm -hmm. well and like do it because you love it. You love the art of photography, not yeah. because you want like the validation of others like, hey, I'm doing the trending thing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you know, I do like that it has brought more awareness to just the craft in general and whatnot, but like, everything there's you know extremities there's a high there's a low it's a double-edged sword kind of thing and um i try to do my best just to say in the middle and when i get a chance i try to save my peace <laughs> for sure <laughs> yeah well i think uh just the fact that you've been doing it at like such a high level for so long and kind mm -hmm. of not been out there um mm -hmm. that kind of says a lot about like how you you 
handle your business and like mm-hmm. you just constantly sharpen your sword and just get better and better and better mm-hmm. behind the scenes you're yeah. not big on like showing off and stuff like that yeah. yeah not really my uh this even like this year particularly um i like hardly shared anything right. um i but i worked a lot yeah. and i created a lot of work and um I didn't really like share anything until like, you know, that final New Year's Eve post. And it's like, hey, here's some unshared favorites from the <laughs> yeah. whole year. Check in. Yeah. And whatnot. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but I admire that a lot in others. And uh, the people I am close with all have a, you know, a similar mindset. And I don't like them because they have a similar mindset, but because I can see it being executed in their practice. Yeah. And, you know, some of my favorite photographers right now, they all probably have under a thousand followers wow. on Instagram. And that just really puts in the perception for people who, you know, use followers as value. Um, they all have under a thousand fo- followers, but they're some of the best photographers in the game yeah. right now. Some of them are from here, from Arizona. Hell yeah. And then there's a few I follow that are out from a uh, Seattle area that blow my mind. Yeah, man. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's like kind of shows like film photographers, like they they care about the art like you know the the mm-hmm. good ones care about yeah. the art and it's like not so much about the the clout i guess yeah like i got to give a shout out uh to uh phoenix street club it's a little group of guys that are focusing on some art and whatnot and um i'm not like a part of their group or anything but i do admire them and i would say we're you know acquaintances or friends but they do it you know for some of the best reasons i'm seeing out here right now Nice. And um, they're very talented and dedication to craft gives me, uh, you know, inspiration. Like, hey, not everyone's in it. Because you can get, you know, kind of uh, jaded. Yeah. And you can hear it in my tone. And I try not to, like, let it overpower how I feel today because I'm very much neutral these days. But you can hear it come up, like, when I talk about certain things. And uh, But it is nice. So it's nice to see that there are people out there that it's like, okay, like maybe I'm not as extreme as I think I am. And there are people who also care about it in this way. And, you know, sometimes get even a little frustrated if people aren't, you know, giving it the respect that it should. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm not alone out here. Like, like I shouldn't feel so bad about myself. Yeah, (laughs) These other people hold themselves to the same standards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. no, exactly. Yeah, dude, for sure. And uh, I wanted to touch on... um, you know, you you said you do like commercial work, stuff like that. And you're mm-hmm. part of a association, the National Press Photographers Association. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. a big deal, right? Yeah. So how did that whole thing happen? You're part of a few other associations as well. But how mm-hmm. do you get included in things like that? Uh, mo- uh, I think all of them I had to a- apply. Oh, so, so you get, actually had to apply. Yeah, for, you have to apply yeah. and you usually have to write out like a little like summary of like kind of like what we're talking about. Like why are you into photography? And especially when it comes to photojournalism. And that's where I... I feel like I've learned a lot of these um, expectations is in photojournalism, you're held to an extremely high standard for how you're treating your photography morally and why are you shooting and why are you shooting that subject and does that subject know or not? And if not, then why are, how are you using the work? Right. And how are, you know, and so uh, with like the MPPA, it was just an application and you submit a portfolio um, and a lot of like, you know, the PPA and I'm a part of the Arizona Photography Alliance as well. Um, a lot of them is you submitting work and then just showing work or uh, um, putting in work toward and time towards, uh, you know, going to the group sessions and showing a commitment. Like it really is mostly about showing a commitment. Wow. And so if you're not going to show up, if you're just going to do it to say that you're doing it, then they don't want you to be a part of it. Right. And um, I just got accepted into like Getty Images photojournalism Ooh. program too. And that was a little bit of a like going around a couple of turntables. I had to submit my portfolio a couple of times Damn. and submit some essays. But I wanted to go that route because I wanted to receive media passes without the obligation of who I was shooting for. So when you shoot under these type of organizations, you're getting the benefit of a doubt that you're going to shoot for the right intentions, even if you don't have anyone buying the photos afterwards. Right. And so that was something that I wanted to show people was like, hey, like I may not be here right now for you know, some big time magazine. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, but you know, I am here to shoot and document the 
the whatever we're doing and you can trust because of this you know status or certification or whatever that i'm doing it for the right reasons for sure and then ppa their whole thing about it um you can i have a link to it on my website and everything you can kind of go into them and a lot of what i say you can kind of get from that as well so yeah yeah and i i like that that makes sense uh, when you say like uh, where you can get these media passes with almost having that accreditation or whatever the yeah, word is, yeah. where it's just like they can expect that you're going to be not only documenting for the right reasons, but also mm -hmm. producing at a high level if you're right. associated with those people. Right. So, I, yeah, I mean, fuck, that's crazy. I mean, it's just like a, like a job, like you got to kind of mm -hmm. submit your resume in a way. Yeah, and it's interesting too because like what this does is it sets you up to capture the uh, – the um the experience and but you have to submit your photos and hope for them to be bought wow. so that's like the next game is the license game yeah is you're submitting then like you know you go out i shot the uh world championship for uh uh yeah the world championship baseball game in scottsdale a couple years ago and i shot that for getty images and i shot five rolls of film that night and so like you know five times 36 whatever that is I only had like four photos get bought. And, uh, you know, they sometimes they pay good and whatnot, but that's not always the point. But that's also just show like, you know, you can go out there and shoot stuff. But when you play that game, you're also risking like no one might no one might buy your photos. Yeah. And so but to be honest, for me, like I didn't care. I just wanted to go shoot the game. For sure. Hell like yeah. that for me, like part of the I'm experience. At, yeah. Yeah. Like I'm at a point right now where I don't need to rely on. And I understand that's like a very privileged position to be in where I don't need to rely on payment to shoot what I want to shoot but it's also allowed me to be more free in what I choose to shoot and how I use the photos afterwards yeah I so, love that dude oh mm -hmm. uh, man um so I want to talk about recently you won a competition yeah you shot a photo uh mind blown yeah <laughs> dude that picture was six fuck yeah i remember when you, you first posted it i thought it was dope and then like yeah. later on you came and like came on and like had posted about how you won this uh mm -hmm. what was it the uh, uh monster children yeah yeah so kind of talk about that was that another like application thing you got to submit your oh, work yeah. and like yeah whole thing yeah so i'm i'm really big on photo competitions um i a few of them um, I really like, you know, you're competing, you're going with the, some of who others consider the best photographers in the world. And a lot of these competitions require very, like, uh, a lot of work to apply to them. Um, whether it's one photo, 15 photos, sometimes you got to pay, sometimes you don't. Um, and not all of them are difficult to get into, but you're also going against like I think there was 30,000 submissions <laughs> for that photo competition. And I have, I have entered that one three times before. Like three and, years in a row type deal? Oh, yeah. Oh, and wow. never received anything. And um, what's funny about that photo winning is, I mean, almost everything about it, the, even how I shot it, it was, you know, at Fountain Hills. They do their annual green fountain explode. And my family was going to go and they were going to go without me. And I was like, oh, I really want to go to that. That'd be cool. And so I played hooky from work that day. So I almost like didn't even go all together. Wow. And so I played hooky from work. We go and I'm like, I'm going to bring, I like, like I said, I kind of bring just my camera everywhere, everywhere and right. I just shoot. And I love the fountain and it was kind of like, you know, what I would consider an obvious composition, like, you know, water in the air, people kind of scattered about. And I'm like, all right, there's something here that has potential. And we were actually like walking to the car when I saw this dude in this like shirt, the pattern. And I just like liked the way he looked like no really particular reason. I was just like the lighting was nice and whatnot. I'm like, oh, it'd be cool if I paired him up with the fountain. And so like I kind of like to start making my way and, you know, got my camera, my settings all ready. And um, I love reacting to other people's reactions. And so he had been having a conversation with somebody and like something like where he was like going to hide his face. his face. Yeah, yeah. And it was just like perfect timing with the fountain and everything. And I just like, and also I never shoot portrait, like portrait. Yeah, yeah. Up vertical. Down, yeah, right, right. And never shoot vertical. Yeah. And like, it was just an instinct that I happened to like flip my camera and like shoot it like that. 
And so, and then, yeah, then I waited a couple of weeks. So I finished the role and then got it back and was like, oh, fuck yeah. Like I got <laughs> it. Nailed like, that shit. And so, um, yeah. and then, then going to the competition, I was thinking about what to submit for, what, whatever, what category. And I submitted two photos, one of my other favorite photos. Um, and uh, I submitted it the night before the competition deadline. Oh, wow. So you were one of the last 30,000. Yeah. And I don't know if that was maybe one of like the reasons why I got seen or whatnot. <laughs> the most but recent one. I submitted the photo. And then two days later, the judge of the competition started following me on Instagram. Ooh. And so I was like, oh, okay, like that has to say something. I'm like, because that was pretty big. <laughs> That's a big and deal. for those who don't know, Monster Children is one of the biggest surf skate magazines out of Australia. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, I, I didn't huge. know that either. Yeah, they're huge and they're global. And I've been a big fan of like what they do, how they go about all their documenting and uh, the whole surf and skate culture and they bring a lot of photography into it and um so to receive that news i had won the travel competition or the travel category and whatnot especially with what the prize was it felt you know kind of unbelievable Fuck it, and so and then i've won some smaller ones since then but that's the biggest one by far Dude. and uh definitely will you know kind of holds like a special place of accomplishment in you know within me so for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like validation to yourself, but also like your yeah. validation in the industry as a yeah. whole, like and as a film photographer. Well, yeah. And that that's important to note sick. too. That was my first film photo that had won a competition because I've done like exhibits and I've won stuff before, but to have Digital. been like, yeah, with that. And so like to have it be a film photo on my Leica that shot it the way I shot it was like, all right, maybe I am doing something that's, you know, a you know being seen here for sure and so uh but yeah that and then they just posted our article because <laughs> i won that like technically um like almost a year ago but they just posted our interview like a couple months ago yeah it's funny because it's like, kind of like a short interview too she's like why yeah. did it take you guys so long to yeah. post this? i don't know <laughs> it's like Who oh knows? shit we forgot about <laughs> yeah <laughs> but and, no that's cool man yeah thank you of course man no i saw it i, I needed to bring that up because i feel like that's a good like accolade yeah like with your with your journey especially because it is mm -hmm. with the with the one camera with the one lens with mm -hmm. the portra because is that portra four uh, that one's Porsche 400. Yeah, it's like the um, classic tones. Yeah, and I, like I pretty much only shoot with Porsche, like 400, yeah. primarily 800, because um, I shoot a lot of uh, like mixed light. I yeah, guess, to say right. like I love playing with shadows and highlights, and um, 400 is great, but 800 just gives you that extra, you know, step of flexibility for sure. Yeah, and you even took some Porsche 800 into uh, a Suns game recently. Oh yeah, <laughs> and so those pictures turned out sick, dude. Yeah, there was thank one, you, man. of course, man. There was one of, that you took behind like the panel of yeah. uh, the. Um, I don't know who who was was it like Tom Chambers and all them. Yeah, yeah. so uh, that's like when they're just doing their little outside interview, and I love just taking you know my camera to stuff like that because i didn't go to shoot photos like it was me and all my brothers going to enjoy a game together but i love just like being on the scene and shooting what i want to shoot and that's actually another big project of mine um that's called damn it's just called damn, damn. Nice. i've been documenting just the fans the phoenix suns fans for it's been four years now since like and, the finals days <laughs> yeah and i think anyone that's a suns fan um you know it's hard being a suns fan <laughs> <laughs> and when, you know, the, all the hype was happening and we made the run and we were going to the championship, it was like very out of world experiencing that. For sure. And um, I was like, this is never going to happen again. So I need to like, I need to document this. And I was really big on the, you know, the people, um, you know, being a Suns fan myself uh, for, you know, my whole life. Um, it was, uh, it felt like a cool opportunity to document such a strenuous relationship. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and anyone sure. who's been a real Suns fan, like for, you know, a long time and you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. For sure. Like you went through the Barkley and Dan Marley days, you went through the Steve Nash and Studemeyer era, and now we're dealing with Booker and then whoever we end up adding on the side, now it's KD and whatnot. But um, it's just a, re it's a repetitive pattern that I've noticed and the fans, stay the same for sure. and they are not shy about showing frustration and i've always appreciated that about sons fans and so i thought that would be cool documenting and you know the infamous words damn came from devin booker as he shook his head when, when we lost, lost the, the championship finals, yeah. and i loved that yeah i loved how that expression especially coming from him really 
wrapped up not only his era but like the entire son's dynasty yeah dude um, or like their whole history of a team it was just like like i say that every after every damn game damn son's like come yeah on. for sure <laughs> so dude yeah, yeah i love that man no mm-hmm. for sure and like talking about the sons like i mean i saw you at a couple sons games when i went with yeah. ritter <laughs> yeah but um yep. yeah like i 100 percent know what you mean because i moved out here a december of 2014 just a few months before Devin was drafted mm. and um i don't know if you knew this or not but like The Suns were so bad, bro. Yeah, it yeah. was like like we were like nineteen wins one year. Yeah. I remember, like I think it was seven, like two thousand seventeen, or maybe mm-hmm. even sixteen, sixteen or seventeen. We had like fucking yeah. nineteen wins the whole season, yeah. bottom of the fucking barrel, mm-hmm. <laughs> spot fifteen. But me and uh, Marcus, because I knew Devin, yeah. We were we were watching every game yeah. like at the crib, and we would like even if we were like being shit on, we would keep the game on and watch till the end every of course, time. Of course, and our whole thing was it's it's so funny. It was because it was almost like at at one point we would like give hope. You mm-hmm. know, like there would be like that first half and be mm-hmm. like okay, second quarter we're like it's we're always within the first half. we're within ten. We can do this. We're losing the whole game, but it's like we're yeah. within 10. And then that second half comes and it'd be like third quarter. It's like, all right, we're kind of losing it. Fourth mm-hmm. quarter, just shit the bed yep. just completely. Man, it's I, like, okay, we played them tough. <laughs> like, yeah, dude. And like, I feel like nothing. I mean, obviously they're doing much better. Yeah. But like, sure. we still have these like little flashbacks. It's like, I'm always, I'll <laughs> always have PTSD of the fourth quarter. Yeah. Because sure, like, what dude. it was even this year, we're up by 20. Yeah, I, uh, I forget who we were just playing. We were up by twenty, recently, and then yeah. we lost it. Yeah, and so, and then, unfortunately, the three games I've been to this year, we've lost Everyone. all of them. Damn. <laughs> and so, but they're doing good, like right now, right now. Yeah, like over in the, the past moment, few, so like four games or something like that. They've yeah, been, yeah. And we actually had the one where we did the opposite, where it's like we were down by twenty, and yeah, then fourth quarter turned it around. That was a good one. And yeah, this year has been like extra special with it because, uh, or with like the Suns relationship, because I've got to shoot quite a few behind the scenes sons events Ooh. now that's been really nice and it's been purely built on uh my photography and my relationships nice and so it was nice that was very reassuring yeah. too that's like, a full circle moment for you yeah like <laughs> i think my favorite photograph i took this year was um when we did the l valley campaign oh with the cars yeah because yeah. that mm-hmm. was uh um wasn't nick there and stuff like yeah dude yeah. and i didn't even know we didn't even know that so like because it was like a few people working on like it was one project but right. there was a few groups that were all kind of doing their own thing too and when i had gotten told about the gig i didn't even know what it was really and so um like basically my connection had uh let me know about it and was like hey like can you be available this day at this time and i was like ah like i'm actually not available at that time i don't they wanted me to get that at three but i don't get off of work until four and so i show up like way late and i get there and there's like all the security clearance i'm like oh what's going on i show my media pass and whatnot and i'm like i thought i was just showing up to like a low rider video <laughs> yeah yeah or whatnot and then um i see uh my my connection that i'm working with and uh he's like oh, i want to introduce you to some people and i turn around the first dude i see is nick yeah and i'm like what are you doing here man he's like what are you doing here <laughs> and uh it was just funny because like world. yeah and we'd never gotten to really shoot together like that on like a yeah like on a platform like that and then um went up and like met Devin and uh some other guys were there and whatnot and it was just a really cool low-key thing and um it was nice to have like the community involved in it and I didn't really have like a shot list agenda so I was very free to shoot what I wanted that's cool and so um I was shooting black and white film um everyone was shooting color digital Nick is the only one um that was shooting film or no uh renee was there he was shooting film okay and uh and so uh but yeah i shot one of my favorite yeah probably one of my favorite photos this year is like clay zapian 
who uh, he's a tattoo artist, but he's also one of the leaders of the sophisticated few. He's coming around this corner. He's on his bike. And I framed it to where Booker driving the low rider, the El Valley one was right in the background. They're all kind of just wrapping around the corner. And I just like, I didn't even look, have time to look in the viewfinder because I'm like running to get in position. I just kind of did one of those like, oh, okay, kind of things. Yeah. And it ended up being like one of my favorite shots. Like Fuck I shot yeah. flash, black and white in broad daylight. Damn. And I just was like, I think it'll look cool. Like I think the contrast will be different. Yeah. And so that was something that was cool. Like I shot something different than everyone else that day. And I got to keep a lot of the work as my own. And I shared it with only specific people for that day. And um, yeah, it was really neat. And I felt very grateful to be a part of it. For sure, man. To be a lifelong Suns fan and then have yeah. that opportunity is a really, like I said, the kind of like a full circle moment for you, I'm sure. To be shooting on film oh, with yeah. your Leica yeah, in dude, the way that you want to do it. Man, like for me, <laughs> that was like, like I had a conversation with Book that he probably would like never recall. <laughs> but like I got to talk to him for a minute because what a lot of people don't know is the car kept breaking down. Oh, shit. yeah. We're trying to film the commercial and whatnot, but it kept breaking. It kept overheating. <laughs> Oh, no. And I don't know a bunch about cars, but it was something with like the radiator and because it was an old car, it needed water to like, so they had all these water bottles filling it up and because it kept overheating. And so we're all just like chilling on the side with all these <laughs> guys filling it up with, and nobody had like, so what he said, like these pallets of water bottles. Oh my and God. And that's honestly one of my other favorite photos that day. I took <laughs> a photo <laughs> of all the water bottles in the car and everyone trying to fill it up and shit. And um, I talked to Book for like five minutes just sitting on the side and I actually snapped his portrait and I haven't shared those photos yet. Yeah. Um, but it was cool because like for me, I feel like I'm talking Kobe Bryant. Fuck yeah, dude. No, like, he, I think yeah. that's crazy for you to yeah. like grow up with someone like that, like on a personal level, go to school and then see them like blow up and whatnot. But like, insane. I was trying not to like fanboy. Yeah, yeah. I tried so hard not to get like, I wanted to ask a selfie with him so bad, but I'm like, nah, man, be professional and just take his <laughs> portrait. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny that you say that bro because i actually uh when i had marcus on because because marcus and i have been close for a while like he yeah. kind of had the opportunity to be a part of some of the stuff like mm -hmm. we were able to go to his house for uh like away games and shit mm -hmm. like that and uh there was one time that marcus actually came out with uh with me to an away game um at devin's house because Damn. Uh, Devin was gone, obviously, on the road. So Davon invited me and said I could bring Marcus, too, to come watch the game. Oh, yeah. Because he was having a few people over. And it's so funny because he talks about that time. And he's like, yeah, I've told this story a few times. And I tell people that, like, I think I fanboyed too hard because I never <laughs> got invited back. Yeah. That was uh, the exact thought in my head was like, man, do not <laughs> say, like, don't say anything dumb. And um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I did say something that was kind of like cheesy about because he's a big fan of uh, he's a lover of film photography. Yeah. And uh, we were talking about cameras and he was admiring the Leica and whatnot. And I was like, yeah, man, I'm a shooter, too. Uh, <laughs> and he kind of laughed but kind of didn't <laughs> so i was like damn it i was like i'm not i'm not gonna get any more like, sun games after this <laughs> i'm bombing <laughs> yeah i love that but like when i was telling marcus i was like dude it's so understandable though like to have that energy of like i'm talking to kobe bryant right now because like in mm -hmm. a way like that is the kobe bryant of the suns ever since steve nash oh yeah like he is the one guy that has came and switched this whole scene up from mm -hmm. being the worst team in the league to going to the finals. Oh, yeah. He's the only one that was even on the squad still today mm -hmm. that was on the squad in 2016. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So it's like I he's can't the only believe one. it, man. Like, as crazy. A, as a diehard fan, he's been my, I've loved watching him play. Yeah. Like this whole upcoming for it. And um, yeah, with the Suns and their history and all of that has been just very, I've been very grateful as a Suns fan that he hasn't left us yet. Yeah, dude, he's the hometown <laughs> hero, dude. And he loves yep. it here. The people love him. Sweet. So yeah, it's like, I don't see him going anywhere anytime soon, bro. Well, that's, that's even better to know. Yeah, so, for yeah. sure, dude. No, it's, uh, yeah, it's cool though, man. Like it's, it's cool that you've been able to kind of see both sides of it too. Like mm -hmm. before we were super bad because you, you grew up you know with oh, the sun yeah, so to kind of go like oh. the peaks and valleys man to go no pun like, intended yeah <laughs> <laughs> the, the whole spurs rivalry the yeah you know from meta world peace elbowing steve nash in the face <laughs> oh, like shit, all that shit dude. back in the day man like i was remember that when he like broke that. his nose and shit yeah oh well that was actually from kobe dude 
Yeah, if I remember correctly. That's I like think. an iconic photo of like him like fucking bleeding. You're talking about Nash, right? Nash, yeah. When yeah, he got, I, like, I think that's bleeding. when uh, Kobe, I think, dunked on him and like elbowed him in the face or something. I might be wrong, but um, that's such a long time ago. But like we watched elbow. all those games live, like all my cousins, we'd all get together and watch the Suns games and go crazy and paint our faces. Fuck, and yeah. Do like we're all the little kids and like <laughs> orange and purple and yeah. <laughs> whatnot. So no, I love it. I love the whole thing. And that's even made the whole damn problem project like kind of tying it back to photography like what has been really fun about that yeah. because i feel like i'm almost capturing myself in all these people yeah because we've all shared these same emotions of you know like you said going through the valleys and yeah whatnot so it's just yeah it's just a interesting to be a Suns fan hell yeah dude. i mean damn an arizona fan in general <laughs> yeah man fuck yeah i love it um so as we kind of start to wind down there's a couple things that i have on here yeah. talking about um you know your director of marketing for arizona organics yes uh, that's a big deal i mean they're mm -hmm. they're big out here and mm -hmm. um you've been with them for some time now yeah um, so I kind of wanted to touch on like, is there anything that you're doing in the cannabis space that you're super excited about anything coming out soon or what you're working on or anything that we could push for uh, in that realm of your world? Yeah, um, a lot. Actually, um, getting back in the cannabis space was exciting because it's very wow, wow west. And I mean that in a way that the cannabis industry is like almost like in a, it's, it's still in its infant stages where there's still a lot of operations that are being like figured out. Yeah. And because it's so heavily regulated, sales and marketing is very difficult. And you have to be very creative in how you use your mediums and then also with what media you're putting on those mediums. And when I say mediums, I'm talking like billboards, yeah. ads, like typical advertising type stuff. You can't just advertise to anybody. And so something that was really exciting for me that we started doing heavily last year were the events. So because we were kind of going through a sales and operations like undertaking and redoing stuff, we didn't really have a lot of stuff to market per se. So we had to create experiences. And so, and that was something that was trending at the time. And it was kind of a blessing that when I onboarded on Arizona Organics, they were just about to celebrate their 10 year anniversary as Arizona's first dispensary yeah big deal. and so um yeah that was cool like it was like first dispensary first dispensary to hit 10 years let's you know let's make a party out of it and so we i worked with a lot of people just trying to learn things i'd never really thrown an event of that magnitude before and we're talking like thousands of people Jesus. and so um i had like some experience bartending at bigger events and that's the extent of it um but i've never like managed vendors or sold merchandising ad slotting and um you know held that responsibility of three thousand people on our property yeah and you know and then they all have to be entertained and you know and you have to accommodate certain things and so the events were big um and that was very exciting we partnered with a lot of people we uh partnered with almost every low rider group out on the west side oh, really? and wow. um that was really big was i wanted to show our appreciation for the community and in glendale on the west side lowrider culture and stuff that's more held within the neighborhoods is something that doesn't really get i will at the time like a year ago it's changed even a lot just Since, like fast yeah. forward but um that wasn't really involved a lot and a lot of lowrider crews were actually in the midst of getting banned off of glendale avenue because of the city really? and so we we're like you know how can we turn this into something that's a appreciating our culture that helped us even get to this point because you can't be a business of 10 years without people purchasing your products for 10 years yeah and so yeah we got all the low rider uh, clubs involved and we had all these cars that are hopping and everything yeah. um we brought out uh i had uh, got a bunch of local artists um that was always something that was um i was passionate about was including local artists and people who were up on the up and coming. And, you know, I had recognized this was a platform that we could put them on. And so we only worked with local artists um, for the entire lineup. We threw a whole concert. We had like 25 cannabis vendors participate, everyone who we work with in the store, um, food vendors, food trucks, artists and vendors, all that. And then we ended up doing around 2,000 people the first year. Damn. This year we sold out and did almost 3,500 people. And I'm not like, you know, we're not event throwers, we're a dispensary. And so 
to have even the option to do this like on a private property and do it all like legal and execute it um has been really cool dude fuck yeah, yeah man i mean to be the guy that's like the the overseer of the whole operation too yeah. i'm sure that's like a big undertaking that's like making you flex muscles that you've never had to flex before <laughs> oh yeah man like yeah just operationally it was very stressful but then also like working with more people yeah. you have to be completely dependent and trustworthy that they're going to execute what you are working together to do and then you know it also you kind of have to take on the you know you you're taking on the expectations of others too because i've yeah. you know I've worked with people that were not fond of the way I ended up executing things on some stuff. I see. And, um, you know, I, and I would say most of my work relationships, like 90%, I'm in good standing with everybody. But that was something that was difficult. I think specifically in the cannabis industry is just, you know, everyone's very protective of their turf. Yeah. And uh, the drama, like, I don't understand the drama really. And I won't like go into that, but um, it's there. And it's easy to get sucked into. And sometimes you don't even know why. Yeah. And so that was something like this year, we stepped back from events a lot. Um, we're only really throwing our anniversaries, our big ones a year. We're doing a few car shows and stuff, which are smaller. We actually have one tomorrow night. Oh, really? Fuck yeah, yeah, lifted and lowered trucks. <laughs> nice. So there's like a bunch of different themes and whatnot this year. But um, we work with a car club that manages and does it all. And they've been nice to work with. But um, besides that, uh, you know, being innovative in the space. So... A couple of things I am very proud of that we've been able to accomplish there that I was very privileged to lead was we're also the first Arizona dispensary to be fully bilingual. Oh, really? Yeah. So you would think in Arizona, more businesses would put an effort in being more inclusive and inviting, yeah. um, especially to a, uh, you know, a group that's like half our state. <laughs> Literally. And so uh, with us, especially in Glendale, um, yeah. in me having my background in web design, cannabis is kind of like 10 years behind in website development because of the limitations and regulations. But because of my history and what we were doing, I, we were able to find some loopholes and we are now the first and only still dispensary to have a fully bilingual website and cannabis menu. Um, we also launched Arizona's first uh, AI bud tender. No shit. Yeah, so that was really neat too. On the website? On the website. Wow. And so something was kind of neat was Arizona Organics had founded their own cannabis strain back in the day and named it Papa's OG. And it was cultivated out of here, Arizona and Glendale. And just last year, we decided to sunset that strain. And um, just, you know, not going to produce it anymore. That's just not where it's at. And so we decided to take that persona of Papa's OG and turn it into a character. Nice. And so that's who we're like Papa's OG is coming out of retirement to help your cannabis shopping experience. He's and the he's AI. the AI bud sender. <laughs> yeah. So that's been fun to play with. Um, but yeah, the cannabis industry has been a uh, really special and interesting to work in for sure. Hell yeah, man. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, do you have any other, uh, any, anything to like plug that is going to come out and like, like I said, kind of end of February and thing coming up for AZ Organics that yeah, uh, people um, should look out for in the industry? Yeah. So, um, actually we're just about to drop the, um, first live ice water bubble hash available on the market and, you know, not to to our own horns or anything, but I have to say it's probably some of the best stuff I've ever consumed um you know in a long time and for people who are seasoned like smokers and fans of the og strands and whatnot like you know what i'm talking about some of the stuff these days just don't hit like what hit back in the day yeah and but some of these more higher end type of cannabis products like hash um it's you know it's old school like hash has been around forever and what you're doing is you're agitating frozen cannabis bud and w delicating or delicately uh, shaking the trichomes off of it until that's all what's left. Right. And then you filter that through several different like like microns. Microns. Yeah. Exactly. Um. Yeah. You saved me right there. I was like, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I literally just learned all this like last week. I ain't no pro or anything. <laughs> I just do the sales and marketing. <laughs> it's um, crazy though. But yeah. But I I visit our production t uh, a lot to do media and. I get to photograph down there and that's actually another project I'm working on too with a few other cannabis grows yeah. and whatnot. I'm just kind of documenting behind the scenes and whatnot. But um, yeah, I would say that product, uh, with a, we're just coming out with a bunch of hash 
like That's OG huge. style stuff. For sure. I mean, yeah. there's only a few companies even doing it at like the high level right now. Yeah. Yeah. I know we talked about our boy Alex DeGroot, Solventless yeah. Refinery. Like, yeah. he's on that level. Um, yeah. We're so about to bring on his uh, hash rosin. Yeah. Big so. deal, man. Yeah. I love that. Um, yeah. Just really progressing the industry forward. I mean, it mm -hmm. sounds like. Um, so with your own stuff with uh, film is dead. Yeah. Do you have anything other than that uh, that photo book you've been working on for three years? Do you have anything else that you want to plug or push people to, or anything on the that might be on the website now come mid February? Or yeah. Anything? Um. Definitely prints. Prints. Yes. Um. I definitely have a few zines. Uh. Finished. Um. You know, you can call them like micro projects. I guess yeah. that have been completed for some time, and I just haven't finish curating what slides I want in the project and whatnot, but they are going to be in zine format. I'll be self-publishing them. Okay. Um, a lot of them will be uh, limited edition, uh, but those, I do have two that should be available come mid-February, but my prints is something I've been working uh, pretty hard at and getting up and running. I partnered with a print lab in uh, Germany who is going to be fulfilling all my work uh, with Very like nice. you know specific paper and comes with like everything signed and numbered letter of letter of authenticity and whole nine yards and Very so nice. um i would say keep on that lookout for that and then i'll be dropping some easter eggs here and there on probably social media on like what to come on like the bigger projects later down in the year Cool. So people can follow you at Film is Dead Studio on Instagram. Is that right? Yes. So follow at Film is Dead Studio. Go to Film is Dead dot studio. Yeah. And that's how you can buy these prints. Uh, you know, check some zines out. Check out what he's got going on. Keep mm -hmm. updated on that. Um, I really appreciate this. This was awesome. This yeah, is man. like an amazing time. Yeah. Thank Flew you. by. <laughs> yeah, dude. I mean, honestly, I feel like I, I keep like having it's hard to stay on one path. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's almost like there's so much to talk about. And when you know you have a time restraint, it's like, oh, wait, I kind of ranted on that for a little too long. Let no, me go back. Perfect. But no, man, I had a good time. This was this was very nice. It felt very natural. Absolutely. Likewise, man. No, it's uh, we stayed like on path the whole time. It's just like the yeah. journey was not like yeah. and, and that's the beauty yeah. of like the podcast format. Yeah. Where it's like, it feels like a conversation, but we covered so much. Oh, yeah. It's, it's like, this is great, dude. I'm, uh, yeah, grateful to have the opportunity to, you know, get to know you more as well. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of knowing you at a surface level before mm -hmm. this is like, I feel like we just became more friends. No, yeah, dude, definitely. <laughs> and it's like these kind of conversations you almost don't get to have like all the time. Like it's very, it's a rarity yeah. nowadays to be able to sit down and have a full length conversation and have it be so intentional like we sat down here to have a conversation straight up and when do you really do that anymore in real life yeah and you know with other people besides like who your spouse or your like most trusted friend is yeah. and so no it was it was special man i appreciate it and i had a really good time Thank you, man. Thank you again. And my fellow Martians, please go follow Christian at Film is Dead Studio on Instagram. Go to Film is Dead dot studio. Pick up those prints. And uh, we will see you guys next time on Mars. Love you. Peace. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in and watching this episode of the On Mars Pod and for sticking around to the end, man. I really appreciate you guys. You are the real Martians. Like this video, comment below what your favorite part was, what was most inspiring to you. Subscribe to the channel, hit that bell for notifications here on future interviews coming out soon. And also follow us on Instagram at On Mars Pod. Love you guys so much. We will see you next time on Mars. Yeah, yeah. How does uh, my voice sound? Hmm. I haven't heard it like this before, so that's pretty cool. Hell yeah, dude. <laughs> I'm about to text David a picture of your globe because I haven't got mine yet. Oh. I'm totally calling him out right now. <laughs> <laughs> I was supposed to have that shit a month ago. I love uh, that we're having like a podcast conversation before I even do it. Yeah, the intro. I, we keep like get, getting into it. So I keep like mentally being like, I need we to save that. We haven't even started yet. <laughs> we haven't even started yet. We're going to start hey. talking and I've already, I'm going to say all my good stuff before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, usually what I do is like uh, I can like cut like parts of like this conversation okay, into <laughs> the pod, either in the pod or at the end of the pod. Mm -hmm. Like I kind of like I did that that one thing with the beeps and stuff like that, almost mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. blooper takes. But like mm -hmm. sometimes I'll just put like extra parts that weren't in the real episode. Mm -hmm. So all that was great though already. All right, cool. I feel <laughs> I feel like uh, 
I feel like good to go. Hell I mean, yeah. Dude, like I feel like my, my nerves are at ease and cool. Uh, yeah, you're, you're good at this. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, man.